Welcome back to week four of Building a Flourishing Family. I'm Grayson Landrum. I'm one of our youth ministry associates here at City Rise. Hi, I'm Ashley Mix, and I'm also a youth associate here at City Rise. We hope you are having deep and meaningful discussions at home on the biblical principles that we've been learning. And we hope that you are developing new habits and rhythms that are bringing healthy change and growth to your household. Last time we discussed which trophies we are living for and how are we defining our priorities. Today, Pastor Ben will lead us into what may be the hardest conversations on the series. The topic is to shelter or not to shelter. And we will discuss the very difficult decisions all parents are struggling with right now as we seek to raise godly kids in an ungodly age. We trust this will be a tangible, helpful session that you will want to come back to again and again. Glad you're here. Let's get started. Yes, good to be back together for session four of Building a Flourishing Family. We're going to be talking about, you know, the boundaries that we have to set for our kids in this session. So I wanted to start with a little question and, and get you guys to give me some feedback. What are some of the, the, the tools, the tips, maybe even an app, or maybe some of the rules that you have in your household uh, for your family? I, I was thinking about, you know, our kids and, and cell phones. One rule we used to have, and I'm thinking we'll reinstitute it tonight. My kids will be so happy, <laughs> is um, no cell phones in their room. Like if you want to use your phone, you got to be in a public, you know, living space. Um, I don't, I think when we moved houses, we kind of got away from that. But yeah. um, another rule we have is that as long as we're paying your bill, that is our phone, not your phone. If we want to look at it anytime, that's, you know, that's our prerogative. And so that's one boundary we kept that we can always check what's on there at any time. Yeah. So they know that we might pick up and, and we'll, we'll tell them when we're going to do it and check text messages and, and these kinds of things. You know, uh, I like the, the Life360 app too. You know, it lets you see where everybody is. It's just, it's just good accountability and, and it's for safety. What about you guys? What are some of these real practical tips and tools that you use to help create healthy boundaries for the kids? We have three young boys, so we've got a lot of rules. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> probably need a few more i would think um but they're just rough we got rough kids they're really just they like to play rough they like anything physical so our house has tons of wrestling greco-roman wwe sumo awesome. yeah. and so no, any of those things pretty much our rule is you guys can do any of this rough stuff but when somebody cries or something gets broken usually a bone or anything like that <laughs> the game is over we move on to a new, new activity I love that. It's all good until somebody breaks a bone, right? And, and it's and it's happened wrestling. We have a broken pinky in the last year. So oh, yeah, wow. Happened. Anybody else? What are some some boundaries we got? Jeff? Yeah, I'll pick something up on the IT side. You know, the phones have just become a way of life, but they're tools and they're important parts of security in young kids' lives as well. Yeah. You mentioned 360. You can yeah. see where they are. They can call you from any place at any time. But you also have a lot of control with these phones. Uh -huh. So as the owner, I very much subscribe to that. <laughs> I'm the owner. I pay the bill. You can dial in what they have access to and when. So we're very restrictive in that sense. They can't see anything except for making a phone call at a certain hour. Mm -hmm. It's wow. pretty early. Later on, they get access to more media, no social media whatsoever, mm -hmm. but they get to, to use it in ways that are productive for them in their school life, for example. Yeah. But I very much see it as a tool and try to encourage them to think of it as a tool and then also have the ability to switch it off mm -hmm. yeah. at a very early hour. Yeah. Just reinforce that this is coming from a place that we love you. We want the best for you. So today's discussion will probably be the most personal one and the one where many of us find our, our daily struggles are expressed. I want to talk about this idea of how much protection from the world we provide for our kids versus how much exposure to the world we allow in their lives. And I'll tell you, as I sit down with other dads for coffee, some of the guys that, that, are, that are in this room, uh, this is the number one conversation we're having right now. I have it over and over again. And the, the chat is usually centered around things like, you know, where should my, uh, where should I send my kid to school or should I allow my child to be on social media or, or what television shows, what boundaries do I have there on the smart TV or how much do I seek to limit uh, my kid's time with their friends who may not be the best influence in the neighborhood. And so basically the question, and I know we all struggle with this is the question is to shelter or not to shelter, right? And, and where do we find balance in, in between those two 
polls. And so parents are really struggling with this one, right? Because we live in such a rapidly changing and increasingly post-Christian society. So I want us to talk about it today. Let's start by zooming out of the details of the parental controls and the tech and the apps and those things. And let's first take a look at the big picture and get a scriptural metric for, for how we make these decisions. I want to give you a really strong passage of scripture that will serve as an overall guide for how you can make these kind of decisions for your family. It's Psalm chapter one, actually the first three verses. Uh, the Psalm says this, it says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Verse three is my favorite part. This person, right? He will be like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither in all that he does. He prospers. I think that's what we want for our kids, right? We want them to be like that tree. We want them to prosper. And so as we seek to apply this passage to our family's life and the decisions we make, it might be helpful to think about this in terms of inputs and outputs, right? I think we all understand this, this concept, right? You get out of something what you put into it and, and vice versa. A nutritionist might tell us you are what you eat. And so that's not always a good thing for me <laughs> at times. A financial advisor uh, might give us advice on how to invest wisely so that we have a, a good return in the end. A, a coach might tell us Hey, kid, no pain, no gain, right? You got to put in the work to get the results. And the idea is this, whatever we put in or allow into a certain area of our lives, it's going to have a direct effect on what comes out of that area of our lives. And so the psalmist opens up, you know, Psalm number one with this proclamation of blessing. I love the first few words, blessed is the man. Uh, that That's our desire. That's our goal to for our family to walk in blessing, right? For our family to be healthy and to be blessed. And so whatever he's going to say next, right? Blessed is the man, dot, dot, dot. We need to, to lean in, listen up, and pay attention to what he's about to say. And the author expresses this path to blessing really in both positive and negative language. You heard that. On each side of that coin, he's describing the what we put into our lives, right? Like the, the inputs. He's teaching us both what we should not and then what we should be consuming. He instructs us uh, that we should not walk or stand or sit under ungodly influences. In other words, the Bible is insisting for us as a family as we make decisions that there are times when we will willfully and actively block things from, from our kids' lives and from, uh, from our marriage as well. We would block the wrong inputs into our family's life. And at the same time, the psalmist is also telling us what we should be inviting into more and more. Uh, open the gate for this in our lives. And namely, that is the law of God. It's the word of God and how that we need to meditate on it day and night. So he says this path to the, the blessed life, it, it's, it's to consistently and intentionally delight and meditate upon God's word. By the way, as, as parents, this is why it's so important that we spend time in scripture memory with our kids and we get them in Sunday school where they're memorizing scripture because the scripture says, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. And so parents, we have to ask the question, are, are we reading to and quoting God's word in the home as a steady diet of truth? Is that the main source of influence in their lives? Now let's think for a moment more about the output side of that equation, right? So, so we get this, if we get the input right, this passage gives this beautiful word picture of what the output can look like. And it's this beautiful image, right, of this giant tree and it's nourished and it's strong and, it, and it's fruitful. And that's what we want for our kids. That's what we want for our marriages. We want to be strong and flourishing like that tree. And we want to be healthy and resilient and successful in the, the things that matter. And so it's all about inputs and outputs. Now, so we have that scriptural foundation. Let's zoom back into these issues that maybe you're likely dealing with right now with your kids and the, and the kinds of questions in the back of your mind right now might be, well, where do I send my kid to school? Or do I let my kid have Snapchat or, or TikTok, right? Or do I monitor or limit their internet access? Or do I track their movements and screen their messages? How, how can I find a balance in between sheltering my kids 
from the world and actually equipping my kids for the world. Now, I, I want to let you off the hook a little bit and tell you that I, I'm not going to give you the rules today that you need for your family. You know, we're still very much trying to, to figure this out. Uh, but what we can do is, is, is we can give you a litmus test for how you as a family can make these decisions and end up on the right side of, of these decisions. And Psalm 1 is the litmus test, right? Psalm 1, as we read it, it's, it's very simple. If a school or an app or a friend or an activity is in a category of the counsel of the ungodly, then it's just a no. It's that simple. On the other side of the equation, if, if the thing in question, if it's something that leads us to delight in God's word more, if it invites us closer to Christ, if it helps us flourish more in a godly way, then it's a yes, right? So this is, this is an easy uh, matrix for making a foolproof decision on how we wrestle with some of these boundary issues for our kids. And so I hope you'll spend a lot of time in your groups really digesting and discussing this principle together. Uh, I want to leave you with, with kind of some decisions that we've made as a family. Now, we, we don't have it all together, and we're still very much trying to figure this out, but I'd love for Kelly just to share with you kind of where we've landed personally for our family on, on this kind of balancing act of shelter or not shelter. So like many of you, we've really wrestled with this question of to shelter or not to shelter, and I'm sure we haven't gotten it exactly right at many times, and we are definitely still a work in progress. But for what it's worth, I want to share with you how we as a family are seeking to find balance. We have decided to shelter our kids from ungodly influence in spaces where their worldview is being formed. And at the same time, we've decided to expose our kids to the world intentionally in places where we are called to be salt and light. And this may look different for every family. Yeah. What this looks like for us practically is we have chosen an explicitly Christian educational model for our kids where their wor worldview is being developed. And then at the same time, we have taken them to serve on mission in hard places where the brokenness of the world is laid bare and plain to see. So the general idea we have been applying is this, protect their minds from the seat of the scoffer in terms of school choice, and then give them a very up close and personal exposure to the effects of sin while on mission and when we're there to help guide them to proclaim the gospel and make a difference. Yeah. I hope that this is a helpful case study, at least to hear one family's very, very imperfect struggle to get this right. Yeah, we're trying. We don't know if we've uh, got all the right answers, if we've landed perfectly on this balance. But for better or for worse, that's 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 where we are right now. The thing I know is this. I'm confident that all of us here and everyone watching from home, we have the same goal, right? We, we want our kids to flourish. We want our kids to be like that tree. And and what we're after is re it's really not sheltering our kids from the world. That's the wrong language. What we're really talking about, what we're really trying to do is equip our kids for the world. And so I hope that in groups like this, we can walk together in community and support one another as we are each trying to find our way and navigate this really tricky culture and help our families flourish. So I want to talk about that a little bit more and discuss it together with you. So let's keep talking about this together. I really want to hear what's been working in, in your family and how you're making these decisions. So, so here's the question I want us to discuss. How does Psalm 1 we just read it. How does that passage inform us and help us as we make dis decisions about school choice, you know, smartphones, social media, and those kinds of things? Uh, Kelly, I'll let you share first. As I mentioned earlier, we've chosen Christian uh, education for most of our children most of the years, but our firstborn, Landon, poor thing, was our guinea pig. He's done <laughs> exclusively homeschooling, homeschool co-op, co university model school, and he did spend two years in public school. And um, we chose this public school. It was super close to our house. It had free college education built in. He would have an Just associates when he graduated, if he actually did the work, um, <laughs> all other issues. But, um, but anyway, he came to us at the end of his sophomore year. He'd been there uh, his ninth and 10th grade year. And he said, mom, I haven't done anything really bad yet, but I feel like I'm getting tempted. I was like, okay, back to Christian school it is. And, you know, it's different for every kid, but I just knew you know, based on Psalm 1, he wasn't flourishing anymore. He wasn't being watered. He was in yeah. this um, just environment that he just couldn't flourish in because it was just so much negativity coming at him. And so we immediately got him back in into a Christian school and he graduated this year and feel like he's on a, a good path in life. Yeah. And it really was a matter of us just like listening to our kids mm -hmm. because he really came to us with a cry for help. 
You know, it was like, I, I just, I don't know that I can, I don't know that I can do this. I don't know if I can hold up to this kind of pressure. So that's, that's really good. Pastor Rogers. Yeah. I mean, I think what's important, you know, we've done a combination of public and private school for you some of that. And it, what's important is, is each family feeling a liberty to make their decision, right. not Absolutely. somebody else telling you what to do, Absolutely. whether that's mom works or not, that the, you know, somebody said, well, the woman shouldn't, you know, it, it's, there's liberty, right? Yeah. There's not a legalism in this. There's a liberty that goes along with that. Blessed is the one who, and then the choice to sit here or to sit here, to stand here, to stand here, yeah. to walk here, to walk here. Um, if you're going to pay for education, my perspective is get as much Jesus as you can. Because where teenagers are, where kids are, I'm gonna, they're going to be teenagers and kids, right? Yeah. If you're going to pay for it, it's the it's the influence yeah. that you're paying for. It's the coaches and the teachers and the yeah. character of the leadership over their lives. People. Our aim with our children is when you leave our home, you stand on your own two feet. And I just moved my son into his apartment in another city, in another state. And as he and I were driving over there a few weeks ago to get him, you know, he stayed with some friends and then found a place. But I'm like, hey, you know, here's the natural order of things. We raise you to stand on your own two feet. Yeah. You could always come home, but you better know my goal will be send you right back out the door <laughs> because it's not, you, you. I didn't raise you to come back home and live with me. Yeah. I raised you to go, leave and cleave and go build yeah. your own. So one, I'm just always reinforcing a biblical worldview. That's good. I've got friends who their kids are in public school. They go off to college and they're, they're thriving. They're walking with Jesus because his mom and dad did an awesome job yeah. of of constantly framing and shaping the biblical worldview. Yeah, I've got friends who sent their kids to public, they're to private school, paid a lot of money for it, and they're the grief that they have and that yeah. they're wrestling with is deal. So it's not is it this school or is it that school? Yeah. It's it, are you dialed in? That's right. In the ways of God, and you're constantly shaping. Yeah. Because um, where kids are, where people are, there is sin. And so how do we help them navigate their choices and how do we, how do we coach and call plays at a certain age, you know, from, from zero to 13, I'm the coach. I'm calling all the plays. Yeah. 13 to 18, we're going to, I got a player coach and I'm going to coach and consult. I'm going to call plays and I'm going to consult at 18 and we're sending you off, man, I'm your consultant for the rest of my life. Yeah. Yeah. You know? That's kind of how I view those timelines as they break down. And I just, I want people to, I want my kids to flourish. I want my people I pastor, I want their kids to flourish. Amen. But it's, 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 you got to stay dialed in. Yeah. You, dialed in. you know, I agree that what's way more important than, you know, the, the choice for where you go to school is the choice of what do we do under our own roof, right? Like, what do we do to, to, to help our kids flourish? So let's go back to Emily. Um, I'm a one-year-old, so I have really a lot of parenting experience. So I share with you guys, <laughs> and it's we're really not as hard as you guys. You're the time. It's very easy. So yeah, I'm the, something that my husband and I have talked about in you know our future decisions that we have with her is just the fine line of, you know, like Roger said, your kid's not going to live with you forever, so you don't right. want to shelter them too much to where then they get out and people are like, you're really kind of weird because yeah. our parents told you nothing. Yeah. But you don't want to be just a free for all. So I think, you know, where that line is of, okay, you are sheltered just enough, but you also know, you know, that these things happen in the world and you know how to face those decisions when they come to you. So you're not, you know, we don't want to send our kid to college and they're like, what is this? You know? Right. So, right. yeah. Right. You know, so I'd love to hear a little bit from some of you guys about how you've applied this kind of Psalm 1 test to social media, because that's such a big deal in uh, our kids' lives today. And there's so much pressure pulling kids deeper into social media. So, uh, Well, I was going to say, it's a reminder that enemies always were prowling around, right? Like a lion to kill, yeah, still destroy. Right. So he's going to use anything that's going around culture, especially social media. And so as I talked about earlier, having these conversations, because you have to remember, it always comes back to a heart issue that your kids are going to be struggling, right? What are they using to fill that void in their heart? Yes. And hopefully in the home, you're having a safe conversation like, we love you. Like reminding your kids that they are loved and seeking all this other stuff fills no void, fills yeah. no need. But they're going to dabble around in different things. Yeah. And so it's just always knowing to have control when you find things out 
when they confess stuff to you. Because a lot of kids will start confessing and you you might pounce on it because you're <laughs> freaking out. Because right? yeah. there's also a lot of thrifty things on your the phone's two secret apps, right? That hide what they're doing. I don't know if y'all know about that, but that's also a thing. Not of streets without. I just honestly want to know there. I thank you. But it's hard issue. If they know that you are a safe place, they will confess and they will come to you. That's good. And so it's just how you approach these conversations with your kids out of the understanding and love. And even, okay, what are your thoughts on this? Have them process yeah. versus always being told everything. Yeah. They need to discover, like all of us have to discover, have a history of probably rebellious ways and your, you know, different ways to be tricky with your parent. Always a hard issue and loving them with kindness and knowing that Jesus loves them so much and that this is their their journey too, yeah. you know? And sometimes you don't always like them having their own life lessons because you are the parent, yeah. but it's just being mindful of what is on social media, TikTok, Snap, whatever's popular and just have conversations with them about it. Well, why do you think you should have this? Well, what is why does Debbie have this? Just, I would say basic conversations to figure out where their heart is at in their head. And then that determines, no, their heart if they're seeing a girl like this, they don't need to be on this social media. If they're not seeing my sisters, we don't need to be on Instagram. Yeah. You know, understand yeah. where, where their heart is at. I love that. I love that. Communication, heart to heart, keep that that relationship open so that they can come right to us. Um, I love that. That's so good. Any other parents? I mentioned from a parent, but again, I'm offering a little bit of a different perspective because neither one of my kids have cell phones yet. Uh, nor know how to turn on the computer to do social media. But how many of us, this is not just for our kids. I mean, yeah, I pull my problem. phone in my pocket right now, and I mean, within the first half of a second, I'm tempted to click on, if I allow myself to have it on my phone, social media. That I mean, I, I'll just say it. I really think that that social media is completely responsible for all this anxiety and depression issues that are happening to us. And then furthermore, falling into our, spilling over into our kids. Mm -hmm. So I really think it begins with us. I mean, if, if, if the kids are in the back seat and we're at a red light scrolling Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook, mm. and seeing these things that we're comparing ourselves to, which again, comparison is the enemy of pretty much everything. Yeah. And I'm comparing myself to the Whitfields and the Taylors because I'm seeing this on social media. Now I'm stressed, I'm anxious, and now my kids are getting the feel for that. So... I really think it starts again at our level as a parent in social media. Yeah, I didn't come here to get convicted, man, today. I would just want to talk about the kids, you know. <laughs> That's so good. Murphy, would you like to add anything there? Yeah, just Will and I both came from a background of really not being sheltered. We went to public schools and we saw all the things you shouldn't see and do. But I think my mom and his parents definitely instilled in us a confidence of, this is your faith and yeah. um, this is God. And you, you know, they gave us all the resources to build our own relationship so that we had the confidence when we were going to school and we were faced with choices, we could say no. And we knew why we were saying no. And God provided, he provided friends, he provided um, for us along the way. And so I want to do that for my kids. I want to build so their confidence and uh, their relationship and, we were always at church. We met at church. Yeah, that's awesome. We met at church too. Yeah. So that's really where we're going, Murphy, in the final session, session five. We hope to see you back uh, for that one because we're going to talk about that moment that we we launch our kids out into the world. And so I'm excited about that. Thanks for joining us today. What a rich conversation, guys. I, I'm encouraged. I hope those of you watching at home are encouraged. We'll see you back for session five next time.